You are listening to the Better Two Podcast with DM Needham. Hi, gang. Donna here. Thanks for tuning into the Better Two Podcast. Today's guest is Charlie Sheldon. Charlie used to be a commercial fisherman. Sometimes his commercial fisherman... Well, he didn't necessarily do everything above board. And what I mean by that is back in the 70s, sword fishing wasn't exactly legal, but yet Charlie was still doing it. And we talk a little bit about that. We also talk about his book series, the Strong Heart series, as well as water dousing and wanting to go to Alaska. So... Today's episode is brought to you by dmneedham.com, where you can find my books, the uh, Better to Burnout series, my days with Dancing with the Dark Muse, as well as Love is Worth Waiting For, and also Kitty Mystic. Kitty Mystic is a place where you can get intuitive readings done by me. So I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Charlie. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Nice to be here. Where, Where are you located at? I am in uh, Tacoma, Washington. Okay. That, I, I've not been to Washington. I went to Oregon once for a weekend, and it was pretty nice. And I know they're not the same, but a lot of land, I'm sure. It's, uh, they're similar. They're somewhat similar. I've been out here for almost 32 years now, so okay. it feels like home. Yeah. I've been here roughly 30, so at a certain point, it's like, yes, I'm from New Orleans, but that's not home. <laughs> Yeah. Just you, you. After being at a certain place, it becomes your home, whether you yeah. grew up yeah. there or not. Yeah. Um, but let's, since you do have actually your story, takes us kind of to the Gulf of Mexico, which is right by New Orleans. You know, it's not. It's about an hour drive away, hour and a half drive away. It is. <laughs> um, so l- let's talk about this. So you were down there doing something you should not have been doing, but you liked fishing. But you were doing this as a career. This wasn't just some whimsical. Let's go fishing, boys. So tell us a little bit about your story. Uh, I was, that's true. I was a, uh, working as a fisherman uh, out of New England. And uh, we'd, we'd, we'd been fishing for ground fish, so-called, uh, long codfish and attic. Then we switched over to fishing for lobsters offshore in the, in the deep water. And we did that for a couple of years. We got wiped out by the Russian fleet in the fall, winter of 1972 and had another bad year. And then, then we heard there were a couple of American boats harpooning swordfish out on George's Bank the summer of 1973. And it was illegal then. And the reason was it was illegal was they determined that swordfish had mercury in their flesh of some level. And they outlawed swordfish. This was, in, I think, in, the, in about the mid to late 60s. Okay. There had been a big Canadian fleet of, of draggers that were longlining for swordfish for years off the east coast of the U.S., and they stopped. And then this bootleg swordfish fishery opened up down in the Gulf of Mexico. There were about a dozen boats from New England that went down there, and we had a buyer, who I won't name, who found us a way to like miss the way stations. And of course, swordfish were, even though technically illegal, were still in demand. And actually, an, as another side note, swordfish had less mercury in them than tuna fish but because tuna fish was. So anyway, at, at the time, so we went down. <laughs> so we went down and we rigged out and I took the boat south. And then the skipper came down and met me when we got to Panama City, Florida, which is where we were living, tied up at the dock. And we fished in the Gulf of Mexico for swordfish. And in uh, March and April and May, and then uh, we'd catch, we'd go out for a week or so and fish for the fish and then bring them in and load them into this guy's truck. And he'd drive north to the Fulton Fish Market in New York, missing all the way stations. And it was a totally cash business. And you're right, it was technically illegal. (laughs) Actually, even before that, while we were lobstering, I'm pretty sure everybody who was involved in this is now dead. So I can say this. <laughs> Statue of limitations so in, has in run. 1970, because I'm getting old. So like in 1973, we were lobstering. And we moved all the gear up to the Browns Bank off Canada, which was also illegal. 
had to sink our buoy line so they couldn't find the gear. And Stan, the guy I fished with, had a friend named Garth Gorham. And Garth fished out of Nova Scotia. And, and Stan and Garth started talking. And Garth said, well, I can go out and harpoon some swordfish. And then you can sell them. We'll transload them off at, at sea. And so that's what happened. Just they had a phone call. And our, Garth rigged out his boat and went out and harpooned some swordfish. And then we, we got in the radio together. And when we were up there fishing on Brown's Bank, he pulled alongside and we loaded his fish into our boat. And then we steamed back, you know, a day and a half back to New England and unloaded the fish and sold the fish. That was illegal, too. <laughs> well, you know, growing up in Louisiana, I, I did fish in the Gulf. I never went on a charter boat. My dad did. My grandfather had a boat. My dad had a boat. My grandfather used to make trawling nets. So yeah. I watched him make trawling nets. I wish I would have paid more attention when I was younger because it was at the time you're a kid, you're like, well, that's pretty cool, but you don't really yeah. grasp the work. Cause I mean, yeah, he's yeah. making a hundred, 200 foot net and you're like, you don't think about it. And he would go out trawl, especially during shrimp season. And yeah. he, I mean, he would get coolers and coolers of shrimp and sell them out. And, you know, people would come by the house to pick them yeah. up or he'd sell them yeah. there. And yeah. that was an extra income that was, dare I say, you know, tax free, yeah. which, you know, back then that was a different time. People, you know, you didn't have to have a permit to sell shrimp. You could just sell them. Right. Right. Well, or maybe you did need a permit, but you know. <laughs> I, I think there's still quite a lot of that that goes on in different yeah. sectors, the cash business, but oh yeah. I mean, that was anyway, that was now nearly 50 years ago, but <laughs> anyway. Those are fun times. But I mean, here's the thing. There, it's, it's 50 years ago, and we were talking a little bit off camera, the fact that things that fly flew back then don't fly now. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, dare I say now, Big Brother's watching every move you make. Well, if, if not, that's true. I mean, it's true with a national security state, whatever you want to call that. But it's also true simply because there's a, all these digital footprints that we put down every time we do something. So, right. you know, um, you and I can talk on this thing and you're recording it and you might trash it, but we don't have any idea whether it'll ever be permanently no. trashed. I mean, <laughs> so yeah, it's a, it's, it's, you have to really work to drop off the radar these well, days, I think. You know, <laughs> there's so many things it's like, so many things we take for granted. I mean, I've hung out with celebrities before. I've sat in a restaurant and talked to them. I don't think I could ever have that ability to do that now for the sheer fact that somebody's got a cell phone and somebody can take that picture. And if they take that picture or they take that video of you talking to somebody, somebody can turn around and misconstrue it completely. Yeah. I think that's a, there's not enough attention paid to this, but there's a huge sea change with the the cell phone camera, you know, about what was that 10 years ago that those first really appeared. Mm -hmm. And that's just transformed the way research is done, the way articles are done, the way court cases are. I mean, it's astounding that you never, we never used to have this kind of evidence. I mean, it was, <laughs> you know, no. and so well, now it's, it's amazing. Well, I mean, even today I was reading an article about how ads for podcasting now can become interactive. Which is just, you know, yeah, you, you would be able to, such as if you're listening to it, say, on your phone, you'd be able to click on the ad thing and it would take you to the site. Well, that's, that's no different than Facebook. I mean, if something's up on the Facebook, right. you click on that, it'll take you right to a book you want to sell or a podcast but, you want people to listen to. But this is just another way now that we're going to put advertising and podcasting, which, yep. you know, a lot of podcasts already have that. Now you can interact with the ad. It's not just something that, oh, I can listen to and look at the picture. It's actually something you can interact with. So we are just we are just amping up the interaction, which is good because you're engaging. But then again, how much tech is too much tech? I mean, you you obviously looking at your credentials in your life, you you had a life where there wasn't as much tech. And granted, I didn't have first half of my life, there wasn't that much tech. So how do you do you think we're better for having all the tech oh wow i know such a, a I know. hard question <laughs> actually i know i don't think so I, I i know there's all these benefits but no 
And and the reason I say no is that it's just become so complicated, so much information, so much noise. It's just hard to know what to focus on, you know, and people anyway, it's it's a, it's so different. As you were talking, I was thinking, you know, in the old days when we were at sea fishing, the only way to communicate to shore, if you're out of the, you know, was by over the marine radio telephone mm-hmm. that, you know, I had to line up and you could make a call and it cost some money, you know, and that was, uh, that was a big, a big step, you know, and that was kind of an innovation. And, and uh, of course, nowadays with these satellite phones, people can be, you know, plugged in almost anywhere with GPS Mm-hmm. You know where you are, where in the old days you didn't. And I mean, that's just the, the way the technology is developed. I mean, I'm sure sure people will argue that there's a tremendous amount of benefit from all of this and the convenience f- for sure. But, you know, in, the, in truth, I think in truth, what's happened has been the, the model we have is an advertiser supported model. So basically all of this, it just forces us to be proposition 24 hours a day with people hawking stuff at you and i think there's a i think that's terrible because because then where where do you have time to think (laughs) well i I mean you make a very good point there was an episode of a tv show called sliders that you know i'm not sure if you're familiar with that show or not they they would basically slide from one dimension to another dimension and they ended up in this place where there was all this media and this show was done sometime in the 90s. But there was all this media everywhere. If you looked at something, there was subliminal advertising everywhere, which how much is, you know, how much subliminal advertising is on the net? We'll never know. But so there was the subliminal advertising that constantly made you want to consume. And so you worked and you got credits and then you were working, you know, it was basically the credit system. You never were actually able to get out of it because it was a cycle that was constantly being perpetuated. And that's kind of where we are now. And when you when you're talking about the the fact that you know we're constantly bombarded, when you think back to the 80s and the 70s, even somewhat of the 90s, you could go to dinner and you know your parents would say, okay, well, here's our here's the number of the restaurant where we're where we're gonna be. If something happens, call us there. But that call would never happen. And now it's like, oh, I'm at lunch or dinner. Oh, wait, my phone's ringing. I'll, I'll be right with you. I watched a couple on a date once and both of them were on their cell phones. And I'm like, so why did you go out to the restaurant? Right. Right. I don't know. It's, I can remember, I did a lot of traveling in my um, bureaucratic job that I had. And I watched the evolution in the nineties and then the first decade of the two thousands of how computer use in airports changed from, cable to wireless there was this huge push on in the early 2000s to get outlets at all these waiting areas in the airport so people could plug in their computers or their cell phones but then everybody went wi-fi at which point you don't need the plugins anymore except to charge your cell phone and you get your data from Mm wi-fi and so at some point along that way as you say i was waiting for a flight somewhere and i realized that 95% 95% of the people in the waiting room with me were looking at their phone, watching their phone. And I can remember being in China in 2004. And back then, if you wanted to communicate with your business back in the States, you had to go down to a com- computer center and rent a computer for a small fee to plug in, to log in, to get into the whatever then was called the net to talk to your company. This was before cell phones became computers essentially and mm-hmm. that was 15 years ago yeah so th- things change so fast people don't realize it until no. i mean it's 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 <laughs> just to date myself I, I can it was when when i was like when i was like eight which would have been in 1955 right that's dating myself right the first tv came into this little neighborhood in western massachusetts and all the neighbors came down to watch, look at this TV. And it was the TV was about the size of my 11-inch computer screen today, mm-hmm. right? That was the first TV in 1955. And by 1960, everybody had a TV. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I can remember I can remember when they set up the um, area code system for telephone. So you could direct dial from like Massachusetts to Ohio before you had to call an operator and have them connect you. I mean, you know, so it's, 
it's it's amazing how things have changed. But back to your original point, um, all of this change is be, because either to make things more convenient and simpler, mm -hmm. or to help sell us more stuff. And it's a little of each, I think. And so now you have the situation where it's very hard to get away from everything being monetized and, you know, just intruding on your thing. And certainly on the internet, what I notice in trying to promote my books, you know, it's just one big hustle. Mm -hmm. Everybody's trying to hustle everybody else. And it, it used to be many, many years ago, the challenge was finding a publisher who'd actually run the typesetter to print your book. Now that's not the problem. The problem now is to just be noticed. Mm -hmm. Anybody can get published. You've got to be noticed. And that's a wholly different kind of argument. And the only way to be noticed, I'm sorry to say this, is to be either outrageous, offensive, you know, or it's so beautiful that they've just got to look at you. And there are not very many of us like that. So what you have is a situation where the more shameless you are, the more coverage you get, mm -hmm. right? And so is it any wonder that, anyway, so, yeah. I'm well, not... I, I get what you're saying because, I mean, when you look at reality TV, you know, before reality TV, you, you had certain parameters where you had to act a certain way. And, you know, back in the early 80s, late 70s, Andy Warhol had made the mention that everybody was going to be famous for 15 minutes. And we are living that now. Right. The, the thing about social media that's really ironic when you think about it, and especially now that we have the pandemic, and this part of tech is awesome because we're having a conversation. You're right. on one side of the oh, country. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, over yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. But social media has made us less social. Yeah, I agree with that. Oh, yeah. um, because you're not having real conversations. I mean, most people nowadays, because they're on their phone at work or whatever, they don't like talking on the phone. But the problem with that not talking on the phone is that I'm typing you something, you're missing the inflection, you're missing every the emotion, you're missing all that. And it's funny because I recently was going through a box and I found a cassette. And yes, I still have a cassette player. And I put this cassette in and... It was me when I was 21 years old. And it was basically like a diary, a mini diary. And I was listening to myself and and go laughing because it's like, wow, you have no clue. Right. But it goes back simply to that phone conversation. If your voice, with your voice, you can hear things. You can tell how a person's really feeling. You can type, mistype something and it can be misconstrued. And it's Completely. out there forever. And it's out there yeah. forever, too. Yeah. So if you're a, I mean, I'm just so happy that there wasn't social media when I was 15 and 16, because I would have put down some pretty mm -hmm. bad tracks for the future. Yeah. You know? I mean, you know, you just, you do something impulsively at that age, and but then it stays with you forever. It's very different than, than it used to be. But it's also kind of inexorable. You know, it's sort of like it just, because the truth is, as soon as these services become available, people adopt them. Mm -hmm. You know, it isn't like you could almost make an argument that they don't have much choice about it. It's almost addictive in some way because, you know, if, if these things were really bad for us, really, we wouldn't be using them. We'd learn it. some people would not use them. And I'm sure there are people who've blanked out from all of this, but it takes a little bit of work to do it. I mean, a couple of times I have a, a Facebook page that I really don't like to keep. But it's, but, it, it's not easy to get what you're in. It's hard to get out. Well, you know? and, and and as a writer, you have to be on social media. It's like if you're an author and you're trying to sell a book, you got to be on social media. And I will say one of the one of the most addictive ones, which I make sure I don't stay on there, is TikTok. You can get sucked into TikTok. Never been on it. Trust me. All it is is people doing some some of its informative, some of its cat videos, some of its dog videos, some of its people dancing, some of it's totally ridiculous, and some of it's for books. But the fact of the matter is you start scrolling and you're getting this 15 second to three minute video and you can choose to watch all of it or you can choose not to. But it's it's you know, you're it's it's there. I say uh, action at your fingertips because you're watching something. Well, it's, it's, it's that gratification. It's for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of it as anybody. I mean, I think that one thing that's changed without people really noticing it, I think in the last seven or eight years is the YouTube videos have become a huge thing. And so 
most I'm one of those people who just kind of click on a few YouTube channels to kind of do a catch up on news or whatever. Well, the trouble is that that uh, there's the good part in my mind about YouTube. Let's just take that as an example. The good part is you can find videos about how to make it, how, how the mm -hmm. first people made a traditional birch bark canoe, which is fascinating, right? Yeah. For people who've been hiking in Yosemite, but there's also stuff that's just really toxic and dangerous, but it's, like, it's, but here's what, here's what, ha what I heard. I saw this, I saw this in a YouTube video. Someone was talking about Northern Greenland and the teenage kids in Northern Greenland today who are, almost to a person leaving the island or killing themselves. And what this person said was, with the advent of the cell phone and the computer and Wi-Fi, these kids used to grow up knowing only the country they were growing up in and hearing stories about the rest of the world from other people who are looking at books. But now by seeing it in real time on screen, they're completely mystified and unhappy with where they are and they feel trapped and it's very depressing. And I think that's the toxic part of it, you know, that, that, so it's just like all these blessings, it's, it's mixed, but well, it's. I, I had a 16 year old guy I interviewed who, you know, it started at 12. He felt like he didn't belong. He wanted that perfect picture for his Facebook picture. And even when he got it, he still didn't feel like he belonged. So then he took a flying leap off of a building. Wow. And he survived. And he's now learning how he can finally stand again, but he's in the process of trying. They told him he'd never walk again. He's 20 something years old and he goes out and speaks to people now. And he's got a pretty amazing story. But, you know, if we are taught, you know, it was one thing for you or I not to be happy with our lives, because as you were just saying, we only knew what was right there centered in front of us. We didn't have this whole vast knowledge. If you went to the encyclopedia, unless it was up to date, which in most cases it wasn't, you had no concept of things. So even what we learned in school was just a micro little bit of what is out there now. And so we are constantly, constantly getting things. But I will say this about YouTube and, and TikTok. It's kind of like YouTube, except the videos are all real short. YouTube, you know, I'm doing research for a book. I've never been to Gibraltar, but I could certainly go put on a video in Gibraltar and yep. go tour the whole place. Yep. Absolutely. So that is a beautiful thing as, a, as an author. It's a wonderful thing for research to have the internet. I won't deny that. But I also like back there, I have books from the 1980s because that's where I write. They're travel books because those things don't exist on the internet. Right. Those places, some of those places are already gone. Well, I think for for people who are unable to travel or um, housebound or whatever, the fact that they can really see what northern Labrador Canada is like by watching a video of some guy taking a canoe for 60 days through Labrador, that's a gift. That's a mm -hmm. great thing that, that people can have that experience. Um, but, you know, it's it's... I don't know, when, when I was a kid, again, when we didn't have a TV until I was 12. And, but my parents got the World Book Encyclopedia or an older set of the World Book Encyclopedia. And what I did every night was I just start, I'd grab A or M mm -hmm. or K and I'd start reading the encyclopedia. That was, that was it, but, but it was okay. Right. And that gave you that, the thing about it is it gave you more knowledge. I remember, and this goes back to, I'm going to date myself. I would ask my mom, like, so how do you spell something? And she would tell me to look it up in the dictionary. And I mean, now it's like, hey, Siri, you know, if I want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would be the first time she said it to me, I'm like, well, what are you, how am I going to, if I can't spell it, how am I going to look it up? And then I thought about it. You're sounding it out. So it, it gave me research skills. It gave me the ability to use my phonics that I had learned, it made me able to be a little smarter. The one thing about the phone is we have information at our fingertips, which is great, but it also makes us lazy. So here's a, here's a little factoid to brood about. It turns out that as far as we know, ancient humans 30,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago, were were both as nearly as big and as strong or stronger than we are today, but their brain was bigger than the brain today by a small amount. 
And some people have theories that theorize that's because before writing, the only way they could learn stuff was carry it in stories and memory. But okay, there wasn't writing. Then the first way, the first way we learned to export memory was through writing, right? And the, mm-hmm. for many years it was controlled by the priesthood and all that stuff. But th- that way that was a way to store information without having it to be in stories by grandparent to grandchild. Then we developed we developed writing, then we developed the computer. Mm-hmm. Now we've developed the cloud. Mm-hmm. And makes me kind of wonder if this one function of brain size is we had to remember all this stuff. If we now could just click on the phone to get the information we need, we don't need to remember anything anymore. And that isn't our brain going to shrink. And, and, and then are we, are we going, are we, have we effectively created a kind of technology that might be actually dumbing each individual down somewhat because they don't need to use that brain the same way anymore because it's all at their fingertip. Well, and, and here, okay. So I date myself too, because how many phone numbers could you remember back in the day? But, you know, you, you would know phone numbers, you would know addresses, everything was there. And now it's like, if you ask me to remind, remember somebody's phone number, I don't know, I'll just hit a button or tell the phone to call. But I know exactly what you're saying, because now you, you missed one step here, because now we have the cloud, but then we have AI. And, you know, most people yeah, who have seen the Terminator movie here, um, but AI, oh, well, guess what? You need somebody to do an ad copy for you? Well, AI can do that for you. Oh, you want to write a book? One well, AI can write the book. They can write your blog post. It's like, at what point are we losing humanity? Or at the same time, and I'm, I'm guilty of this. I mean, there were programs that you can design the cover for your book. You can change the fonts. You can, mm-hmm. you know, you can, uh, anyway, it's all. You know, it's a it's a give and take because for the author that doesn't have the money to make that cover to pay a cover artist to design a cover they have a way of doing that it's a gift yeah yeah but you know then they have the programs that will help edit your book but the problem is sometimes the grammar switches that they have aren't correct well, there was an, yeah that's so true. <laughs> there was an author that she posted something i think it was the word let's and so it says change it it's wrong so she changed it and then it came back and said it's wrong so she changed it back and this, she just took a video of it because it was like so ridiculous because either way it wasn't liking it yeah i i used to i don't know i've been it's the first book i did was published traditionally by pocket books in 1989 or 1990 and then it was a, they were, did a print run and that was it. Right. And it mm-hmm. was distributed through drug stores and stuff. And there was none of this self publishing. There was none of this computerized stuff. You know, people were sort of switching to computers by the, but by the mid nineties, I universe and ex Libris and a couple of other countries had set up self publishing companies where you could send in a digital manuscript and they, you know, design a cover and you could self publish the book which of course bookstores wouldn't order because they couldn't return them. Right. And that sort of started it. And, and, and that was a huge change because, because with the, and then of course, with the technology, basically print on demand, right? Mm-hmm. When you actually have a, you throw a program in a machine and it prints the book out. You don't have to set type. You don't have to do any of that stuff. And I don't know. I think the last time I read it's something between 70 and 90,000 books a year are produced or I may be off by maybe it's 900,000. It's there's something like 17 million books out there on Amazon or some number mm-hmm. like that. Well, good Lord. I mean, <laughs> how do you even get seen? And, and from the author's point of view, I know that everybody says do social media, have a mailing list, you know, all that stuff. And for those of us or you who can do that, great. Most people who most people can't do that. It's difficult to do that. That sort of self promotion is hard for people. I think. Oh, it's very hard. I mean, I'll be honest. It's very hard. I, for me to put, even though I've been in with the radio and the acting and all that other stuff, it's still a hard thing to put yourself out there because I'm not 20 something anymore. I'm not the cute blonde that I used to be. I, I am not that woman. So it's like for me to put myself out there, I have to get past certain hurdles and, 
even when you're doing the, you know, the book promotion, the podcast is easy because, well, I just put you guys on the spotlight and then, right, right, right. but, uh, you know, doing book work or doing my tarot stuff, I have to put myself out there. It's, it's more of a, here you go. And I've done interviews. I've been on the other side of this and I can handle it. I've done it. But I also remember my very first interview was when I got back from Live Aid. I had gone to Live Aid and the local radio state or local TV station wanted to interview somebody. So I got called into the TV channel. I had no experience. I looked at the monitor. I was a nervous wreck. It's the worst interview I'm sure ever. There's no video that I know of it. And let's keep it that way. Um, but it was embarrassing. And for me now to look at myself doing this, it's kind of a wild ride because it's like, you have to get out of your comfort zone. And that's the honest to God truth about me doing this show. It's like, I had to get out of my own way. And I think that's, that's true for anybody that's trying to do social media or promote themselves, whether it be an author, singer, whatever, you have to get out of your comfort zone and just say, it is what it is. I'm going to be who I'm going to be. And if you don't like me, we don't have to tune in. I mean, I think that, I mean, back to a point you made earlier, the, the, at the same remote uh, electronic business meetings or whatever you call it. I mean, I even remember 15 years ago, there were companies who were trying to do that with, with corporations and stuff where you could go in and get a TV screen and they could do meetings. But now with Zoom and a few others, it's, it's a FaceTime. I mean, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. And I think it's been a, it's probably saved some people during the pandemic. It's a way of, I mean, I certainly enjoyed it. I've been able to get in touch with people across the country or people in my family or friends that I never otherwise would have talked with. That's the great part of it. Oh, I've, heard, okay. I've heard a number of people who, who do podcasts say what you do, you know, it's a way for them to get out there and get, you know, involved with people. And it's a great way to find people who share, share your interests and may have, maybe have similar interests. I mean, my, my selfish motivation for doing these podcasts is maybe somebody in your audience might take a look at some of the books I've done. Mm-hmm. You know, it's as simple as that. If they don't like them, fine. At least they might look. And, and how else are they going to hear about it, right? So that's right. that's okay. That's, that's that's the trade-off. It's and, and I found these actually kind of fun to do. These podcasts are sort of enjoyable. And the ham and me likes likes that to some degree. Well, um, and, and the thing is, the, the reason why I do my podcast the way I do it, yes, we're going to talk about your books. That's not going to be, you know, you're not coming on here just to blow an hour. But the whole fact is, if I don't let you guys, whether it be a musician or an author, if I just sit here and we go, okay, let's talk about your books. Is that something that really is going to grab the, the audience member? Right, right. You know, I want, I want you guys to be human. I want you guys to be real. And, right. and that's why it's like, if, if when I do, when I go out and do interviews, yeah, I most likely overshare, but I'm being real. And that's the way I look at it. If I'm being real, you get to know me and maybe something in my, my story or my journey resonates, then you might want to pick up my book. Right, right, right. And I, I finally reached the point. I reached the point a long time ago, but that in the process of creating a book, if, you know, I could speak to that. It takes me about three years to to write a book. It only takes a few months to write the first draft, but then it takes three years to get it right, change it, work with it, move things around, take out all the stuff that doesn't need to be in there. It's a long process. And that's Mm -hmm. a kind of magical, wonderful, frightening, very personal, magical, creative process. And I believe that every instant a person spends in that creative place is not counted against your days on this earth. I, I really think that that's true. And, and so that's the wonderful part of this. So then the, if you flip to the next, you know, then you get it out there for others to read and you have to, if they don't like it, you have to live with that and that's okay. But the, the active promotion part of it is a very different part of your brain. It's a very different skill set. Sometimes the promotion and the author merge beautifully. I know a guy out here who's a very successful author. He just produced a book called Small World, a guy named John Evison. And I think this book's going to be a national bestseller. He's a really interesting guy, but he's also very gregarious and extroverted. So he's the kind of guy who'll do a book reading and thousands of people will come just because he's such a character, right? Most people aren't like that, right? And and I admire him and envy him, (laughs) honestly. But so the the 
where do you spend most of your time? And, 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 uh, and I've realized, at least speaking for myself, that the, the, the time I spend creating something, whether it's writing a book or doing poetry or drawing stuff or whatever it is, that's nice time, you know, and you don't need any reaffirmation for that. You just do it. But if you're an author, you need some reaffirmation, you know, you needed someone to say, I read it and it talked to me or it didn't talk to me. And, and, uh, but you don't, if you need an infinite amount of reaffirmation, you're never happy because you get it. Someone told me once that if, if you give your book to 10 people and three of them like it, that's just like being a 300 hitter in baseball. You're one of the best. And instead of thinking, if, if, if only nine out of 10 like it, I, I did something wrong. Well, a lot of people think that way. <laughs> well, and, here, and here's the thing about that. You can go, I, I, belong, to some, I belong to some book groups. Right. And somebody, somebody will pose a question a day and it's like, what is the trope that you just can't stand? And then you'll hear one person say, I can't stand if something like this happens or I like this when this happens. Same thing. Same su- subject. We'll say one trope. I can't stand this. I love this. So unless you're writing for what you really want to enjoy writing, you're never going to please everybody. And I think that's the hardest thing as an author. It's like, well, I want that bestseller. Well, yeah, everybody does. But at the end of the day, the outside, it's great to get reviews, but you got to be prepared that not everybody's going to like it. And that goes back to, here's the other big thing. You know, in the eighties, it didn't matter as far as, you know, what was in the book. You didn't have to put a trigger warning, but now please put a trigger warning because you don't know what may, may set somebody off. And it's always like, but isn't that giving the book away? I mean, a trigger can be a spoiler. That's a whole, that's a whole nother three hours of discussion. The (laughs) whole, whole issue of what's appropriate to put in books and who's responsible for which emotion being caused by what you put in the book. And, and I mean, it's become very difficult. Uh, If you, if you're right, if you, at least this is for me, other people may be different, but for me, when I write a story, I write what I see, uh, Mm -hmm. right. I, I try to, I try to only write what I'm seeing and I'm not really aware of how it happens, but it just does happen. And, and, uh, if I'm doing it with the little judge in my shoulder saying, oh, no, you don't want to upset people here, upset people there, whatever comes out is just going to be crap. It's not going to be worth reading for anybody, right? And right. so there's a risk. I mean, I have the my stories for <laughs> it's a good example. My stories, the least ones I did, because they're set in the Pacific Northwest, you can't write about the Pacific Northwest without writing in some degree about the first peoples who lived in the Pacific Northwest because it's still, still very much with us, very involved with treaty rights and everything. But if you're not one of them, and, you're, and I'm an old white guy, right? So I mm. can't, there's a whole nother thesis. If you're an old white guy, you can't write about women or anybody else. And so it's it's gotten politically very sensitive, you know, this whole cultural appropriation thing and everything else. But if you write trying to be conscious of all this stuff, I think you're going to get in trouble. But I I also feel to some degree myself that looking at today, I think the business of fiction and book publishing, there seem to be my, this is my limited, there seem to be more women than men involved in this, um, both at the publishing side and on the writing side. Um, I think women make great writers and are maybe better writers, but I notice I've been to a couple of writers conferences and it's, There aren't that many men, you know, and they're all Mm. old like me. Um, And I don't know what that is, but, but um, it's, if, if, you know, if you write a book, to me, if you write a story, you may want to make some points along the way in the story you're writing about the value of old legends or the value of truth or what really is, what motive, what makes a family. You may want to write about that stuff. But you can't, what you really need to do is tell a story that the reader falls into. Right. And if they don't fall into the story, it doesn't matter what kind of screed you're trying to tell them about, they're not going to hear it. If you write a good story, 
and and they finish the story and they're kind of, I wonder if that could be true, then you've really been successful. And that's all you can do. Exactly. I mean, there was my first book, there was a review. She changed it now, but that's a whole story. Um, (laughs) My first book was written, it's written as a guy's point of view. And he is a drugged out rock star who's a cheater and he's got some serious issues. And I remember the first bad review I got was three stars, which really considering is not bad. I've, I've right. never had a one star, so I'm not going water or two star. But she she says, um, I can't believe I finished the book. I hated the characters and I hated the story. But I thought to myself and my, hu- my husband at the time is like, so are you OK? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, why aren't you upset? I'm like, no. I said, firstly, she finished the book. Secondly, she hated a thing. Hate is an emotion. If she <laughs> hated it, well, then that's good. And finished it. it wait, yeah, and finished it. Yeah. it. Yeah. Wait, wait, so it gets better. So I re- I, I, I had the money. I changed the cover. I ha- hired a professional editor. I re-released it. Do you know she bought it again? And mm. she read it again? She left me a different review saying it was very strange. Didn't really go into a lot of detail. But I'm thought, thinking to myself, so you hated it so much the first time, you read it a second? Yeah. But yet my second book, which has a happily ever after, she loved. She's like, this is much better. So I'm like, okay, that tells me you want the happily ever after fairy tale. That's what you want. My first book is not that. So I, that's what I go. You, you have to look at it. You can't please everybody all the time. And... No. And the thing is, you were talking about writing conferences. The last ri- I did a virtual writing conference about two years ago or a year and a half ago. And the big thing was all about consent. And while consent is good, I'm writing in the 1980s. And, and people in the 1980s didn't stop and say, oh, is it okay if I kiss you? <laughs> that didn't happen back then. If somebody thought you were going to kiss, they were going to kiss you. That didn't, they didn't stop to ask. <laughs> It's true. But nowadays, yeah. that's exba- that's what's expected. At least that's what the, the people in the writing world are thinking, that consent should be there. And I'm I like, saw, well. I saw another, and I, this is probably wrong, but I, I caught a glimpse in the writing community. I'm on Twitter, and I have a bunch of writers on Twitter, and I kind of look at it. And it seems that there's this thesis in fiction today that kind of argues that every one of your characters basically has to have the backstory explanation of how they got to where they are in order for them to be in the story somehow. And I, I could be kind of wrong about that, but my, my takeaway from that was, oh, you mean that, that the reader needs to absolutely be told every little thing about what this character is like so the reader's comfortable in reading on. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, what about the reader who gets a little bit of information, a little bit of information, and then paints their own picture based on the bits of information that mm-hmm. they're given? Anyway, it's it's I've been to a couple of writers' conferences. I'm not um, I'm not very good in the writer tribe. Um, there's so much competition and 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 it just seems um, anyway, it just doesn't work for me well, no, I, I i mean you know the big thing is what genre do you belong to well my second <laughs> book i can say it's a rock star romance my first book i say it's realistic fiction because i had rehab centers following me when i was a, started as a blog so oh. if a rehab center really thought this was a drug addict's blog okay it's realistic fiction it's realistic <laughs> and and i mean i look at it this way i write my books I don't know what category to put them in. I try to figure it out, but Amazon limits you stuff, limits it, and there is no category for realistic fiction. So it goes in general fiction. And then Which you can throw it minor, up. Minor yeah. in general fiction because, because they aren't really thrillers. So there's some, they aren't really, I mean, I, if I could say adventure, I say it's general fiction with some magic realism and magic realism in some sectors is considered a genre because of the South American writers. Um, yeah, there's my my takeaway on this is that there. I know Amazon has like two thousand different genres, I and mean, they can really break it down. I don't think that's right. I think there's only a few genres, but that's just me. But but um, 
anyway, what strikes me about all of this is it's a very competitive business. Only a very few people make a living at it and more power to them. And I think that skill has a lot to do with that, but luck has a lot to do with it too. You know, if you just happen to, you know, if Oprah picks up your book, you're home, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's just as simple as that. You know, if Jill Biden is seen holding a book written by Charlie Sheldon, people right. are going to, what's that the book the first lady's reading? But well, yeah. How do you get your hand? How do you do well, that? I mean, it, it goes back to, you know, what we were talking about earlier, social media. If somebody, if somebody happens to yeah. have something of yours in their hand, it's hot. You know, whether it be the yeah. dress that Michelle, Michelle Obama wore. Oh, that's yeah. sold out once everything. I mean, yeah. and why are we so... Why are we so consumer driven that just somebody holding it? Look, I somebody, you know, and here's the funny thing about that. So let's take a picture out of context. So somebody walks up to Oprah, not that that's really going to happen because we know it won't, but somebody walks up to Oprah, hands you, you know, you get to, you get lucky enough to have an audience with Oprah. Okay. And you hand her your book. Well, she hasn't given it to her handler. She has no place to put it. So she's got your book. She's never read it. But all of a sudden, that picture is taken out of context and blown right. completely out of proportion. And there you go. You're right. an overnight right. success. And in the meantime, she's going, uh, I didn't read it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the, the, the place I've ended up with this. I tried very hard in this third book in the, the Totem, the third book in my series. I did what I, I did, made this decision. I said, I'm going to do everything I can afford to do to promote this book. Mm-hmm. And I did. So I, I won't be in the future looking back thinking I failed to do that or failed to that. But my budget was limited, right? But I did what I, I did everything I could do. And, and, it, and it wasn't, I wouldn't say, I mean, I sold, a, I sold some books for sure. I've actually got, you know, it's, it's sold some books, but it's <laughs> don't change your day job. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, but the, the point is that, that, in the end, there's only so much you can do. You, you know, even if you had a million dollars, there's only so much you can do before it either through word of mouth or whatever kind of starts to organically grow or not. It's just, it's, it's just as simple as that. And I'm sure there are masterpieces that have never sold a copy because nobody even saw them. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And there's others that sell very well. That I mean, I can't tell you how many books I pick up to read that I don't bother finishing because I, at some point I just lose interest in the storyline of the characters. Some of the others are great, but there's always, you know, so, but somebody published it, you know, so. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've heard stories about people that are on TikTok that they got their back catalog. They used to be Kindle Unlimited and they've moved their stuff off Kindle Unlimited, gone wild, wide use TikTok to build their following. And now they're at bestseller. They're, they're, and it's across the board. It's like what Amazon used to be the hugest chunk of their revenue. Now, as they started dwindling down, it's like Amazon's just a small portion. Mm-hmm. They have revenue everywhere else. So I think that's another misconception is that we think that Amazon is the end all be all yes, as a writer. No. And the fact is there's other services now that will, will let you go wide. You know, and, and that's the other thing about technology. What used to be, you know, you were banned in order to put your music out there, you had to have a record contract. Same thing with the writing. And while we now have the luxury of being able to release our art to whoever, wherever, we're also getting under a penny a play or under right. a penny for a page turn in, on Amazon. So right. it's like, in a way, you're, I'm going to say it you're whoring yourself out. You're putting your talent out there, but you're not being compensated. And it always kills me that somebody will sit there and say, oh, well, I got my latte at Starbucks, but I don't want to buy a book. I want that free book. Well, which I, pirate sites are a bad thing and I'm sure you know about it. But the thing is, so you want to go to a pirate site and buy the book or get the book for free. Okay, well, let them have your credit card information. Let them put spyware on your computer, go ahead. Because this is the, the irony here is I have a book that I've been working on. I put the title up on Goodreads and it showed up on a pirate site with a review that they really? had the book. Really? And my husband and I had a good laugh because it was like, well, I guess you've arrived. You're being pirated now. I'm like, but I haven't even released the book yet. It's on my computer. But somebody, you know, that's what they do. And that's a way for them to get your credit card information 
or to put spyware on your computer. But these people, they're just like, I want the free book. Do you realize all that goes into that book? Do you realize how many hours? Like you said, it took you three hours. My second book, it took me one month, a little over one month to write. And I edited it and stuff. And I, it, the whole process took maybe six months. That's the only time I've done that. It usually takes me quite a while to write a book. Mm. And yeah, I for think... Me it's, for me, it's I, I'll write the first draft in mm -hmm. three or four months, but then it'll be years until it's ready. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and, and there there needs to be, at least for me, there needs to be a certain amount of steeping time, I guess you could call, you know, something that where I just let it settle somewhere. And then if I know something's wrong, it'll emerge, you know, and it's a, it's not describable, but it's, it's a, it's a process that when I, I know when I'm done with the process, but I can't force it and I can't push it. Oh, I know what you're talking about. My latest book that I've been working on, I completed it in 2019 and then I rewrote it and I rewrote it and now I'm working on another rewrite of it. So yeah, I completely know my first book, the original book, I started back in the eighties and I never finished it. I've borrowed pieces right, from it, right. but and in fact, the only reason I have the first book I did was because it was a side character. It was like, oh, this will be good for marketing. And I turned it, I was like, no, actually. And so it, it's all evolved. And that's the thing about art, it evolves. But I don't think readers necessarily always realize everything that goes into writing a book and making that art, you know? I mean, I'll go into a bookstore and, and now I'll go into a bookstore and I'm just amazed. I look at all these books and I know, like you say, you know, the work that goes into creating those books. And you know that all these, out of all these books, only a very few really take off or, mm -hmm. I think someone said that the average sales for self-published books is like over the lifetime of those books is like less than 200 for all the books together. Yeah. which means that there must be millions that sell zero, but then there's a few. And I've met a few authors who've really taken off with self-publishing and it's pretty amazing. I mean, it, you can do it. I have a little publisher. I don't, I don't do it self-published, but it might as well be self-publishing because it's just a little like one horse operation. But see, and the other thing that happened was when I lined up with this publisher, one of the reasons I wanted to do that was back then even then, you, you couldn't get books, self-published books put in bookstores because they weren't due returns. But then Ingram Spark came up with a mm -hmm. system so self-published authors can get the same benefit. So essentially, it's just a tough fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just, you just got to hope that you build up a little following and people word of mouth and it works. That's all you can do. Well, what you were talking about, what's funny is, you know, people being successful. Uh, about two or three years ago now, I think it was closer to three, in one of my writers group, they were talking about how they couldn't believe this book was a success and that there was actually more than one book. It was selling for $2.99. It was like 36 pages and it was dinosaur porn. <laughs> and, you know, I, my friend was over and we were talking, she's a writer and we were sitting there laughing about it because we actually read the little, you know, you can read a little excerpt and it was just the most ridiculous thing in the world, but somebody was making a killing off of it because it was so ridiculous right. and because word of mouth, you know, once, once you start spreading that word of mouth, people are going to want to hear it's the pet right. rock, right. you know, come on the pet rock, how, <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 it's a mystery. It, it's all I know for me, again, this is just my own personal, I wanted to do something that I wanted to do. And it took me 11 years to get all three books done the way I wanted to. And I got them done. It's the best I could do. Whether and people like them, those that read them like them. That's, that's all I really ask all you can ask. for, mm -hmm. Right? Um, yeah, it'd be great if they became bestseller. Yeah, it would be great. But chances are virtually zero on that. And that's okay, too. I mean, you only hear from your readers one reader at a time, right? And if, right. you know, so um, 
And as I say to my wife, I say, you know, I spent 11 years working on this and, and uh, it's, it's a much better expenditure of time than watching TV or sitting in a bar room, you know, or playing computer game, you know, whatever, whatever yeah. other enterprise. And so, and I, there's another bunch of books I'd like to start with and do. And again, back to, from a selfish point of view, the time you spend watching those stories happen, it's like this book you're working on, you're rewriting for the third time. That's the magical gift that, that you mm -hmm. have, no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. That's important to remember. Oh, yeah. And I mean, there, there's stuff I, I recently went back and looked at one of the other drafts of it. And I'm like, you know, I really do like this. And it's like, you're getting off the point where you have the story going now, so you can't go back. But you can always use that for a different book. So it's kind of like you, you got to weigh the pros and cons when you're playing around with that stuff. What is the name of your series? I mean, you haven't really, you've mentioned it, but you haven't really said it by name. And while I have notes, you're the author. So pimp your product, please. So my series, it's, it's three books, mm -hmm. three standalone stories, but they really tell one grand story. I call it the strong heart series. There's three books. One's called strong heart. First book, then a drift is the second and totem is the third. They're set in the Pacific Northwest and the Olympic Peninsula and in the Gulf of Alaska in modern day and some very ancient time. They have some magic realism in them. And they really follow an ordinary young girl as she tries to find her family and her power. And she does find her power in an impossible way. And, and it's also, series is also set around a struggle between this group of local people and a mining company that's trying to spoil a place out in the park. So they're, you know, coming of age stories, adventure stories, set in the outdoors, sea stories, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and they're, like I say, they're standalone. Strong heart came out in 2017. And then Adrift is about four months after strong heart ends comes out in 2018. And then totem was released in October 29th of last year, 2021. And Totem, which is amazing, but I, I, I finally got an award. I got the um, nice. Reader's Choice Award from the Online Book Club, which has like 2 million members nice. of Totem as the um, best story in general fiction for 2021. Very on, nice. On the book club. So that was nice. And we'll see if it increases sales. <laughs> but that was, that, you know, it's and the books are in Northwest bookstores and they can be bad from anywhere and and uh, they're also available on Kindle as well as on paperback. And Strongheart, the first one's also available as an audio book. Okay. Um, there's there's two things I want to want to ask you before we we wrap this all up. You're a water dowser. I am. Tell me about it. Oh, that's another long discussion. Um, finding water with a stick. Okay. Uh, or using metal rods to find mm -hmm. similar metals. Most pe people, if it works with me, it works with me the first time it, uh, I tried it. I was about set. Uh, I was 18 years old in the back country of Massachusetts. I watched this guy do it. And then I cut a twig and did it. And it, the twig turned down so hard that the buck, the bark ripped off in my hands. Wow. That's how hard it the, the stick turned. I, I've got many stories about it that nobody believes unless they understand I'm telling the truth. Um, it works with like metals as well as with uh, water. Uh, it's been used by uranium miners to find uranium. Um, utility people use it to find buried sewer pipes and utility pipes. Uh, and of course, People use it to find water and wells, water and wells. And I've I've had experience with people where I take people out to do it, and it, it either works for you or it doesn't. Right. So if I took you out and you took the stick and it's Y shape and you hold it in your hands with the Y pointing up in front of you, and the, each end of the Y is in your palms holding it, as you walk it turns down toward you or maybe away from you if if you if the force is there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i've had people try it and it and it doesn't work right they walk and nothing happens and then they look at me like i'm an idiot and then i 
then they take the stick again and the ends of the stick are sticking out from their hands. And I put my fingertips on each end of the stick and walk before them backwards while they're walking. Mm -hmm. And then the stick turns down because I'm touching the stick. And then they get very weird and very upset and don't talk to me. Yeah. Um, but, I understand. but that, but, and that's true. And, and if, and you're probably sitting there thinking, I wonder if that's true. And you might no, be thinking, no, no, I, no, no, I, it's, it's true. And, 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 uh, so I'll tell you, so I'll tell you one story and then we'll, okay. So the guy I used to fish with, the guy who took a swordfish in Sten, he was a treasure hunter and I treasure hunted with him one year. And I told him, I said, Sten, if you want to find Bellamy's gold, put a gold coin in a stick and drive around offshore until and when the stick turns down, that's where the gold is buried. And he said, Oh, that's bullshit. That can't be true. And one day in his house, I did it with him. I found his well. And then he tried to, he buried a gold coin while his girlfriend made sure I couldn't see where he was. And then I found his gold coin and uh, then he believed it. Right. But by then this other guy had found the treasure. Mm. So, one year he was tuna fishing long, you know, spear and bluefin tuna in Cape Cod Bay. And he was fishing. Sten was, wasn't catching any tuna, but my other friend, Jerry was catching tuna and Sten didn't know why. And I, I cooked this thing up with Jerry. I said, Jerry, I told Sten, I said, go around the stern of Jerry's boat tomorrow morning and you'll see how Jerry does it. So Sten snuck up through the fog in the back of Jerry's boat. And Jerry was standing on the stern of his boat with a stick. In uh -huh. his hand, and on top of the stick was an empty tuna, tuna fish. <laughs> <laughs> and and nice. we always found that funny. Anyway, so yeah, the thing that I like about dowsing, honestly, is nobody's explained it. I believe it's a real force, mm -hmm. and it's just a source of wonder to me that with all this technological glitz that we've been talking about for the you know last few minutes. There's still this thing out, this force that might be out there that nobody's yet able to explain. And to me, that gives me comfort that we really don't know everything. No. Well, I mean, one of my, you know, talking about things that the blessings of the podcast, the neuroscientist I talked to, he talked about how we're all connected. And I mean, you I believe you because I have had too many things happen in my life that can't be explained. Right. I read cards. I've had people that I'm saying, okay, prime example, and this will sound crazy to you. Um, I'm a medium. I do pick up on dead right. people. And usually they show me how they died. They let me feel, which is not the most pleasant thing in the world. So Monday was my mom's birthday. And she's the only, only come to me one time where I've consciously felt her. And that was on Halloween night. So, and this was back 20 years ago. So, so Monday was her birthday. And I'm in my office and I'm doing my work and stuff. And all of a sudden I feel like somebody jabbed me in the side of my head. My mother shot herself in the head. Oh. And I'm like, what in the heck? It goes away. A little while later, it comes back. This kept going on and off all day long until I said, mom. And then kind of stopped. Wow. And so I didn't really acknowledge anything else about her. And she started again. It didn't happen Sunday. It didn't have, it has not happened since it was about her. And I know that, and I know somebody's listening going, yeah, right. Whatever you had a headache. No, it wasn't a headache. I don't have headaches there. I know where my headaches are. That's not it. So it was just mom saying hi. So, yeah. but how do you explain that? Mm -hmm. It just, it's there. It's just there. So. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I think there's a force mm -hmm. that we've yet to identify and I kind of like the gravitational force, but some other force. And I have no basis for that, except that people say, well, no, the reason the stick turns down is because of hidden muscle reflexes and the bark gets torn off the stick. Don't tell me my hidden muscle reflexes can tear the bark off. So yeah. <laughs> like I said, there's, there's too many things that have happened that are unexplainable that we try to explain our rational mind won't allow us. But I mean, if you really look at the movie Star Wars, there's so many metaphysical principles and goes back to the force, but there's so many metaphysical principles there that really are true. We are all connected. And when there's a major catastrophe, everybody is taken down. Everybody's connected emotionally. So if we're all plugged in, we're going to get that general feel. 
And I don't think many people realize that they're just like, oh, well, why am I sad? Well, if everybody else is sad that's around you, you're going to pick up on it. We're main, we're all intuitive. We all have some empathy, hopefully. There's a few that don't have any empathy, but most people right. have empathy. So you're going to pick up on that energy and energy around everybody's energy is always on. I mean, you can be in a room with somebody and feel they can feel nasty and they can feel angry. And I remember taking an intuition class and I had to send anger to somebody. And I didn't particularly like the person to begin with. So sending anger was not a big deal. So I sent anger and, and everything. And when he was trying to get in, I shut him down. And I didn't think anything I was doing anything that would matter. So he said, he said something like, well, I can't see anything but black. And this was after I sent anger. When I shut him down, all he saw was black. I'm like, okay. So about two weeks later, I'm at the grocery store and one of the girl women from my class is at the store and she sees me and she stops me and she was sitting right next to me that night in class and she's like i need to tell you something i'm like what she goes remember when you were sending anger to such and such i'm like yeah she goes you gave me a headache i'm like excuse me <laughs> she goes you gave me a headache and as soon as you stopped it was gone uh, i'm like well that's kind of scary because it is i mean how yeah. we don't realize the inner amount of energy that we have Right. to affect things and affect people in our thought process to manifest things, which I want to go back to and we'll end the interview with this talking about this subject, but you said, you know, in your write up that you had the chance to go to Alaska and you didn't do it. And it's something that has always called to you. And I mean, I have things in my life that still call to me that I've never completed. So right. have you actually gotten to go to Alaska at least since? You know, oh, Oh, yeah, I've been there a few times. Um, I didn't go up there to go fishing, but I've been up there half a dozen times. I've spent time up there in Denali National Park and been on Kodiak and stuff. Yeah, I, but we, I think we all have forks in the road in our lives where we then later wonder, you know, whether the fork in the road is of a date you wish you'd hung out with or it's a job opportunity you didn't take. I mean, I had a, I had two chances to go to Alaska. One chance was after my freshman year in college, I could have gone up to guard a salmon stream. They give you a rifle and a radio and you radio in if an airplane lands and then the Rangers come and get these guys. And I didn't do that. Um, and, but I knew if I'd gone to Alaska at 18, I probably wouldn't have, I probably would have stayed up there. And then I, again, a few years later fishing when I could have gone up to halibut fishing in the spring of, 74 and i didn't and i've always I've, I've always wondered a little bit about that not not like gee i wish i'd done it or anything it's just kind of an idle in, interesting thought you know just kind of wondering well it's the what could have been had i had i made that choice you well, know yeah, but then you then you also think i also think that all if what that's all what could have been but then i also would know there are a lot of things that would not have been, including right. the kids I have and a bunch of other things. So in the end, it, 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 you know, the tracks you put down are the tracks you put down and, and uh, you, have to, you have to live with it. Yeah. And hopefully you, you learn to, and, and, and that's okay. I think the, I guess the final thing I'd say is the, 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 your biggest danger is yourself out in the future, looking back at a decision you might've made, thinking, why did you do that? You know, you want to be, that's the person I'm most afraid of is me out there in the future thinking, you idiot, why did you do that instead of that? And and so whenever I face a decision, I think about that. I think, okay, what am I going to think five years from now if I do this? And that's helped me. That's, that's helped good. Me. Because a lot of times people do look back and go, man, I should have done something differently. Well, I think, well, that's the other thing. I think we all, most of us have a few of those in our past. And the challenge is you have to find some way to, if not forgive yourself, at least, let me put it another way. You have to, we all have, <clears throat> I think, I know I do, we all have demons of some kind or other. And if you don't find a way to befriend your demon, you're doomed. Yeah. But if you do find a way to somehow to make peace with it or have it on your shoulder, with you rather than growing in the closet hidden away from the light then you have a chance 
<laughs> yeah, I'm not going to disagree. I think I think there's so many times we we put our shadow self away because well, mm-hmm. but the thing is you have to embrace it because I, I talked to somebody Wednesday and she has scars because at 18 months she pulled down a cup of coffee and it spilled all over mm-hmm. her, so she has scars and. You know, she went on this journey where she didn't look at herself until she was 25 in a mirror. Uh And it was just, I guess the whole reason I'm saying this is because ultimately she realized everybody's got scars, whether it's physical or mental. And we don't always embrace those scars and heal those scars. We just kind of go, okay, whatever. It's part of me. While it's part of you, if you don't know how to embrace it and forgive it. I mean, yeah. looking at that girl that I said on the audio tape, you know, here I am at 21 and it's like, I laugh, but I also wanted to go over there and hug her. I wanted to give her a hug and say, it's going to be okay. I know where we're going, you know, <laughs> and if only you could do that, but it's, it's just an interesting concept because, you know, here I am able to look at that girl and say, look how far you've come. And it's yeah. different than just looking at, a diary entry because I right. could hear myself. Right. That's amazing. It is. Well, what's really funny is I lived in Texas at the time. I had grown up in New Orleans. So I had the New Yorkish New Orleans accent. And then living in Shreveport in Texas for about six, seven years, I picked up the slow draw. I'm like, oh boy. So <laughs> I was just like, man, I'm glad I don't sound like that anymore. You know, I, I spent I spent four months in 20. 20- 16 on a ship in violet louisiana oh okay anchored in the river oh boy so so four months and then we took the ship from violet out through the mississippi and up to new york to the shipyard but so i spent four months in new orleans in violet which was an interesting place to be well and, and here's what's funny is okay so you have the new orleans accent which is very new yorkish but then if you go further south you start picking up the cajun Yep. And then you have some people that have a true Cajun dialect. And I remember going to a restaurant with with my husband in Gretna, and there was a true Cajun accent. I, well, I grew up with some of that. My mom could speak a little of it. Yeah. My husband just looked at me and goes, what is he saying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, honey, that's a true Cajun. That is a true Cajun. That's what that's the Cajun French accent. He's like, are you serious? I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, nobody, it, that's what the funny thing is. It's like New Orleans, when I left New Orleans, I got accused of being from New York, which was totally the portrayal of people from New Orleans in movies was always the Southern drawl, which wasn't who we were. But then if you go outside of New Orleans, any direction, there's a different dialogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the weirdest thing in the world. Yeah, from Violet, which was south, mm-hmm. south or southeast of the city a little ways. You turn left and you, you're up into New Orleans, into the into the plot that got flooded in the hurricane. But if you turn to the right, you're right down in the belt, Delta lands, you know, all mm-hmm. those bayou towns and pretty interesting. Yeah. Pretty. Uh, yeah. I grew up swimming in the bayou and stuff. I mean, you know, I yeah, wouldn't go yeah. swimming in the bayou now, but <laughs> back then, once again, you didn't think about that stuff. But I'm sure there was chemicals and whatnot dumped in there and we shouldn't have been swimming. But yeah, that was that was how we grew up. So anyway, I thank you for your time. It's been an interesting conversation. I hope you've had fun. I have. I've enjoyed it a lot. And it's it's fun talking with you. And good luck with your book rewrite. Thank Maybe you'll inspire me to start my next series. But uh, it's been fun talking with you. And uh, um, good luck with your enterprise. Thank you. So Charlie's story was kind of fascinating. I mean, with the water dousing, that's something unexplainable. Sometimes it works for people. Some people don't have that gift. It's like not everybody's a medium, but then again, not everybody is, you know, necessarily a card reader or, you know, they're cl- they hear things instead of seeing things. It all depends on how your intuition interacts. And I think we're all intuitive. It's just we all connect differently. And I think that's where we have to pay attention. Just because you can't do the water dousing doesn't mean this person can't. So we all just need to embrace our talents, our given talents. We need to try to tune into our intuition, maybe unplug a little bit and tune into our intuition. 
And also the other thing is, you know, when we're talking about writing, the one thing I want to say to you guys, if you have something you love doing, if it's playing guitar, if it's, you know, writing a story, take 10 minutes a day to do something you're passionate about. Even if it's doing a crossword puzzle, if that really gets you going, then do it because you need to find a way to unplug and to use your brain to be creative. It's one of the smartest things you can do. So, you know, try to step outside the box, try to get, you know, a little bit more creative. And while we're talking about stepping outside of the box, if you have a project, try to put it on social media, try to, you know, nobody likes being, you know, nobody likes pimping themselves out. It's not the easiest thing in the world. Some people are more, nat- more naturally gifted than others, but you have to try. You, it's all you can do. So on that note, I wanted to say that if you want to be a guest on the show, or if you have a question, please do not hesitate to reach out to Donna, D-A-U-N-A at better2podcast.com. That's Donna at better2podcast.com. If you would like to be a Patreon, we do have a Patreon page. We also can, you can also catch up on every episode of the show at better2podcast.com. That's better2podcast.com. And, and, da, da, da. The show is sponsored by dmdm.com and Kitty Mistake Publishing. Also, the audio has been produced and edited by Rich Zai of Third Ear Audio, which who I'd like to thank very much for taking care of the audio for our show. And on that note, I hope you enjoyed the show as always, and I'll catch you next time, guys. Take care. Bye.